Today we're going to be looking at your, your first topic. There's actually going to be two. Your first topic is looking at geography skills. There is just one essential question for today, and it is why can't someone make a perfect map already? And you may think you know the answer to that, but everything that we talk about is going to come down into that answer. There's going to be an elaborate answer to that, not just a simple, this is the answer. Okay? So again, we're going to start with geography skills. The first subset that we're going to look at is maps and geospatial data. All right, how are things arranged is what we're going to be looking at. The first type of maps are thematic maps. And these maps are ones that show the distribution, the flow. It shows different things about an area. Now, an easy way to remember that is these maps have a theme. Okay, maybe the theme is robberies, and it's showing you a map of the city, and it shows you where most of the robberies are occurring. That thematic map is one about robberies. Then there's chloropleth maps. These maps are ones that are displayed in color. Maybe it's showing you voting patterns. You've got uh, the Democrats and Republicans. We've got different colors with red and blue and then other maybe in green. That's showing you data through these different colors visually. Then we've got isoline maps. Now I tried to draw a population density map, but it's hard to do that on a marker board. All right, but that's a good example because it's a map that shows different shadings and uses different lines to display data. And a population density map is a great example of that because it uses different shading and again, different lines that correspond to show you different things. Okay, sort of like a topographical map as well that shows you the curve, that shows you the elevations through the different lines. And then last but not least, I've kind of erased a little bit of it here, but dot maps. And you've seen these as well, I promise, but these are maps like of the United States, and the bigger the dot on the United States, the bigger the city is. The smaller the dot, the smaller the city. Next, we've got map projections. That's your next subset there, okay? The first type of map projection that we are gonna look, with, look at is the equidistant projection. And it looks something somewhat similar to this. Uh, the example that we've used is the polyconic example. And what this means is this gives you the most accurate representation of distance and linear distance on a map in one direction. So like this one, north and south is going to be almost exact. But then when you start looking east and west, then then it's going to become distorted a little bit more. But you've got the, the, the earth, the sphere, um, and you've got it lined out into two kind of halves. And again, it gives you a good picture of one direction distance, but then when you take it and you look other ways, uh, it's not as accurate. But again, the most accurate representation of one direction, okay? Not the band one direction, but equidistance among like north and south. And generally it is north and south. And again, this example is the polyconic, okay? Uh, your next example of a type of map projection that we are gonna look at is a conformal projection. All right? This is one in which compass directions are rendered accurately. It takes the compass uh, and it takes it perfectly. A good example is the Mercator projection. All right? You've got it lines, latitude lines that are running up and down, that are show, or longitude lines that are running up and down, uh, and these show you distance, but they also show you that this is north, this is south. Then you've got latitude lines running east and west, and it's showing this is east and this is west. The Mercator projection is not the best projection to use, but for some reason, that's what we stick with, okay? And that's the one I have on the back of my wall, mainly because it's the easiest one to access. Then you've got equal area and equivalent types of maps. And these are the most, or the best look at a map, okay? It takes the sphere and flattens it out. The best example of that is the mold weed projection. Again, it flattens it out a little bit, makes it more oval, uh, and it gives you a good representation of that. Kind of like the blank maps we've used in class already aspect that we're going to look at is density. What density means is it is a numerical measurement of the relationship between people and space, land. Okay, a numerical distance between people and land. There's two types of density that we're going to look at. The first type is arithmetic density. And if you've been in world geography before, you've probably used this. All right, You take the number of people in the area, not the number of peeps, like the little things you eat around Easter, but there are people in an area and divide that by the total land of that area. For the city of Lubbock, there's about 240,000 people, 239,538 as of 2013. Now, there's 123.6 square miles in Lubbock. The city of Lubbock itself is pretty spread out. You take that, average it out, and you've got a 1,938 people per square mile. Now, you're thinking, man, every mile I travel, there's 1,900 people? No, it's more looking at a square mile, which is much bigger than just a mile across an area, 
Okay? Next is you've got physiological population. What a physi physiological population is, is you take the number of people and you divide that by the er amount of arable land, the amount of farmable land. So you're looking at how many people live on an area that has enough land to farm. Now, if you just took the city of Lubbock and looked at this, it wouldn't be very good. But then if you took the rural area, like the Lubbock County, and took in all the farmland, that number would be pretty good. Now, Another topic. This you can put in your Cornell notes at the top. You can put another topic, and that topic is phenomena of place. Now, in your notes, just put two Roman numerals, phenomena of place. Okay? There's two things we're looking at uh, right now. First is time zones. Okay? Time zones in the world, if you didn't know it, there's not a set time, and everybody's in that same time. Like in China right now, it is not the time it is here. All right? First, you've got to look at the Greenwich Mean Time. In Greenwich, England, the line, zero degrees longitude, which is the prime meridian, runs through that point at the Royal Observatory. At that point from Greenwich, England, at zero degrees, the prime meridian, that's where the time changes. That is the GMT time, Greenwich Mean Time. And then from the GMT time, everything changes. Every 15 degrees of longitude you move, you gain an hour, or lose an hour, depending on which way that you are going. Okay? So in the eastern side of the United States, it's basically 75 degrees west. That is five hours away because you divide 75 by 15, you get five. So it's a five hour difference. And since it's west of that point, the prime meridian point, that means that it's five hours earlier. If it was east of that point, it would be five hours later than that point. Okay? Now, you've also got the International Date Line. The International Date Line, this is not Date Line on NBC, is at 100 degrees of longitude. All right? You've got the prime meridian on one side, and then on the other side, when you go 180 degrees, you've got 180 degrees longitude. That's known as the International Date Line because when you move on either side of that, you're gaining or losing 24 hours because that's how that is made up. That's how that system works. So if you took 180 and divided it by 15, you get 24. It's a 24 hour distance at that point from the other side of the earth. Okay? Next main point is spatial interaction. Spatial interaction is referring to the movement and interconnection of people and other objects. Okay? Movement of people and, and the interconnection among them. The first aspect of spatial interaction that we're going to look at is accessibility. And this is literally how accessible places are. The best way to cover accessibility is to look at a flow map. You look at number one, on a flow map, you look at the interaction among places. Then you can look at the volume of interaction among these places. And then you can even look at the direction of the interaction occurs. Again, it's how accessible this interaction is. Okay? That's what we're looking at when we're talking about accessibility. Now, the next main concept is connectivity. Connectivity is talking about how connected a place actually is. The relationships among people and objects and places uh, across, international, in, across space and how connected they are within that space. Look at it, it's kind of a confusing principle, but it's the distance decay principle. What this is talking about is the further away from a place you get, the less interaction there is with people. Okay, this graph right here gives you a good picture of that. This on the side is commuting, this on the bottom is distance. What the graph is showing you is the further you get away from a place, the less people you have going there. And then the closer you are, to a distance, like the closer you are to something, the more people are willing to travel. But then the further away you go, the less people are willing to do that. All right, this is also known as the friction of distance. And again, this is in a perfect world, that the idea that the further away you go, the less people are gonna travel to get there. The friction of distance is talking about the amount of time it takes to get from one place to another. And then that friction increases or decreases how many people will move to that area for that service point affects the distance decay formula. And what plays into effect here is technology. It's called space-time compression. Basically what it's saying is because of technology there is a reduction of the time that it takes to get somewhere. And with that reduction of time, the distance decay formula is not as severe because with, a re with new technologies and it not taking as long to get it to one place, the amount of uh, distance that someone is willing to travel reduces. And that is all because of the space-time compression. And I'm going to give you a few examples of this. 
For example, Christopher Columbus in 1492 went from Europe to the Americas in a mere 37 days. Okay? Of course, Columbus thought that he was in India, but that's a whole other story. Um, uh, Lindenburg, in 1927, Lindenburg went uh, from New England, northeastern United States, to France in 34 hours. Even better, from days to hours. And then John Glenn in 1962 made three orbits around the world in a matter of five hours. Okay? So you can see the reduction of time that happened here in the space-time compression with technology. Now, obviously, we're not going to hop in our rocket and orbit the Earth in five hours. All right, that takes millions of dollars. But you can see how technology can change this. And because technology can reduce the time it takes to get somewhere, the distance decay is not as severe. That distance decay doesn't look as severe as it did in that other map because technology is now getting better to the, to, for us to reach that point. Now, another point with... Um, with this is networks. Now, a network is just what you think of, probably. It's an interaction in a chain of communication that connects places. Okay? For example, a hub and spoke. Might have heard of this, you might have not heard of this. What hub and spoke is, or are, is it's when a plane, uh, when you buy a ticket to go from Tokyo to the United States, you don't get on that plane and it doesn't go all the way to the city you're wanting to go to. It might take you to China first and then make a stop and you might have a layover and switch planes and then fly somewhere else and then go to the United States. That's called a hub and spokes and that's a network that's connecting to get you from one place to another. Another thing that changes this is technology. Facebook and Twitter, I did my best to draw the little Twitter sign. It's not very good, I know. But Facebook and Twitter are networks as well. And that makes it easier for the space-time compression to make these communications within a network. It's an interaction among places. Okay? And, th and that's an idea of phenomena of place as well because it makes interaction easier through technology. Okay? We've got a whole other topic that should be labeled three, not two. So you've got three topics on this one. Your next one is diffusion. Two types of diffusion that we're going to talk about. First is relocation diffusion. Relocation diffusion is just like the term refers to. It's the movement of people that are being relocated. For this to happen, you've got to have a hearth. A hearth is a beginning point of that culture or that people group. From that point, you then diffuse. You then spread. But diffusion does not have to be a total relocation, a total move to where you're not coming back. It can be expansion where it's expanding. Okay, that's the next point. We've talked about hierarchical diffusion when we talked about the icons of depth and complexity, but it's when you have this type of graph. Like at Friendship, you've got the superintendent. And then you've got the head principals of the high schools like Ms. Spicer. And then you've got the different assistant principals. Those assistant principals are then head of different departments. Okay, this assistant principal tells the social studies department. And then the social studies department chair has different teachers that he tells. Okay, that's a hierarchical diffusion. So when there's information that comes from the superintendent in a hierarchical system, it then goes down to these different levels, and these different levels then break down and give that information around. Okay? Next is contagious diffusion. In my picture there, it's kind of hard to see, but it's actually a person sick who's spreading, who's contagious. Okay? That's the same thing. That's when ideas spread that way among people, kind of like uh, something that could be literally contagious. All right? That type of spread of diffusion. And then the last one we're going to talk about here is stimulus diffusion. Stimulus diffusion is talking about, for example, like when one culture or one company takes a part for, takes something from another company and then spreads that idea. The example that I got is in iOS devices you have Siri. My Siri has an Australian accent. But in Android versions you've got Google. You can say, hey Google, look this up for me. Okay? Android stole that from Siri, that's stimulus diffusion. Okay, there was a stimulus that they liked that they then shared amongst their company.